Welcome to Kitchen Table Electronics Lesson 2, The Measurement Tools. We begin with 2.1, the digital multimeter and a description of some fundamental electrical quantities. The most fundamental electrical quantity is charge. We don't notice generally that matter is charged and the reason is that most objects contain as much positive charge as negative charge, so overall matter is neutral. But if you do work on neutral matter to separate charges, then you can achieve a net charge as shown here by this little girl who's crawled around inside a plastic tub, managed to separate some charge and make a hair stand on end in the resulting electric field. This phenomena was documented in Greek times uh, when amber was rubbed with fur to make the hair on the fur stand on end. The Greek word for amber was electron and of course uh, we know where that uh, word then comes into the vocabulary uh, today. The unit of charge is the coulomb. The, when we refer to charge, we always refer to a net excess charge, and we use the symbol Q to describe the number of coulombs. In terms of elementary particles, one coulomb of charge is about 6 times 10 to the power 18 protons, or minus 6 times 10 to the 18 electrons, where the minus sign refers to the electrons carrying negative charge. When one separates charge, as I showed in the picture of the little girl, one sees things that can be described by an electric field. One of the units it's measured in is volts per meter. We do work to separate opposite charges. Matter likes to be neutral. And we get the energy back again when we let the opposite charges come together. As a result of this relationship between work and energy or electric fields, we define a volt by the difference in potential between two points such that moving one coulomb together over that distance yields one joule of energy and conversely to separate the two charges requires one joule of energy. So once again one volt is that potential difference such that one does or gets one joule of energy from moving one coulomb between two points. Physics students, take a look at advanced topic 2.1 to connect with your e &M classes. Now let's talk about moving charge. A current of one amp, named after ampere, corresponds to one coulomb of charge moving past any given point in a circuit in one second. So the potential difference between the two terminals of a typical AA battery is a little more than one and a half volts. The capacity of an AA battery, you can look this up on the web, is two and a half amp hours. That means that in principle it could supply a current of 2.5 amps for an hour before it was exhausted. Of course, the potential would drop if you try to do that. So the amount of charge that moves when you discharge such a battery would be two and a half coulombs per second. That's the two and a half amps times an hour, which is 3,600 seconds, or about 9,000 coulombs of charge is stored in a fresh AA battery. The energy available then corresponds to moving this charge through one and a half volts. So it's 9,000 coulombs times one and a half volts. And that is 13 and a half thousand joules of energy available. If we draw one amp from the battery, which is one coulomb per second, we get one and a half joules per second. Remember that one coulomb per second is one amp. And we have one and a half volts. So one and a half volts times one amp is 1.5 joules per second 
and we refer to joules per second as watts. So the power available from this battery at a current draw of one amp is about one and a half watts. You'll see from this relationship between current and the energy you obtain by moving the charge, uh, we can write that the power is just the volts of the battery, the voltage, times the current coming out of it, or one and a half times one amp uh, gives you one and a half watts of power available from this battery if we draw one amp at one and a half volts. The way in which the amount of current flow is determined from some source of voltage like a battery is determined by the resistance of the circuit to which the battery is connected. And specifically Ohm's law says that the current increases with the voltage of the battery and decreases with the resistance of the load or I equals V divided by R. The units of R are ohms given by the symbol here omega. One of the things you'll become familiar with over this course is how to identify resistors. Many resistors have a 5% tolerance as stated by this gold band. This means that, uh, for example, um, a 100 ohm resistor would be typically lie in the range from 95 to 105 ohms. And the value is specified by these three color bands here. So orange, looking at our cheat sheet here is yellow, uh, is, um, is uh, three. So we have three, three, and then we have brown, which is the multiplier, and brown is one. So that is three, three times 10 to the one, or 330 ohms. This resistor happens to be of a, a size such that it can dissipate a quarter of a watt without overheating. And um, so that's fairly simple to read. When you get to precisions that are much greater than uh, 5%, for example, here is a 1% tolerance resistor, you need an extra band to tell you the value. So going over here, you see this five band resistor where the 1% here is shown by this band here. And then these bands here specify the value, green, which is five, red, which is two. And I suppose that's supposed to be red here and um, black here, which is zero. So this would be five, two, two times 10 to the zero or 522 ohms. I see 521, okay. So that is supposed to be a brown. The color hasn't come out very well here. Okay, a little confusing, um, but I've put a copy of this chart on the blog so you can refer to it. If you've downloaded Fritzing to design your circuit layouts, uh, you can always try placing uh, a resistor on the board, which you do by going to the parts window and under core parts, just clicking on the resistor and dragging it onto the board, whoops. When you do that, if you go to the window and look for inspector, it will tell you the value of the resistor, so here 100 ohms. If you change that, for example, to 1000 ohms or 1K, um, it will then give you brown, black, red. So it'll show you the correct color code here. Now to make uh, measurements, we're going to use a digital multimeter. This shows a simple digital multimeter that costs about $8 from Amazon. In my movies, you see a somewhat more exotic uh, meter being used, but this is really all you need. It's good to a percent or so. And you see the switch here lets you choose from AC volts, and then this range here is current all the way from 200 microamps full scale, 2000 microamps, 20 milliamps, 200 milliamps, and finally 10 amps for current. Over here, resistances, 200 ohms full scale, all the way to 2000 kilo ohms or two mega ohms full scale. And then here, volts, all the way from 200 millivolts 
up to 1,000 volts full scale for this particular meter. Now, measuring current is fundamentally different from measuring voltage. And so you have to connect the meter in a different way to measure current. So this shows the meter here connected to measure voltage. It says volts, ohms, milliamps. When this red lead is plugged in here, this black lead is called the common. To measure current, you pull this lead out of here and put it into here, and then you put the meter in series with the circuit, so your coulombs per second have to flow into this terminal and then out of this bottom one here. And usually the meter will give you an error if you have it, for example, set on a current range, but put the probe into um, a voltage hole. Now this leads to one of the next things you need to know, which is the language used to describe the very wide range of values one sees in uh, electronics. So typically the smallest values are on the order of 10 to the minus 12, and that applies to capacitors usually, where picofarads um, is a typical value of a capacitor used in a high frequency circuit. Nanofarads, 10 to the minus nine farads, are typical of capacitors that are used in many uh, circuit applications. Micro, which is 10 to the minus six, you might use microvolts if you're in a very sensitive circuit. Microamps, quite likely, if you're using a big resistor. Microfarads for quite typical capacitors, we'll use one in this lesson with a 10 microfarad value. And then inductors, uh, measured very typically in micro -Henry's. Milli, which is 10 to the minus three. I've already referred to millivolts and milliamps as though you automatically understood what those were. And then millihenries, which is 10 to the minus three of a Henry for inductors. And we'll come on to inductors later in the course. Units that are typically on the order of one include volts, amps, ohms, sometimes uh, Henry's. And then I've thrown in here bytes because Digital storage is important when we talk about computers, and this course is as much about computers as it is electronic circuits. Kilo then, which is 10 to the power three, kilo ohms, very common. Kilovolts, I hope you don't have to encounter, but if you ever pull apart an old TV, beware. Certainly kilobytes on a computer. 10 to the six or millions, you actually can encounter mega ohm resistances and certainly megabyte um, storages on computers. Then when you get to giga, you're very unlikely to encounter a giga ohm in anything you do in this class, but you can go gigabytes, terabytes, and even petabytes um, for computer storage. All right, let's begin with an experiment. We're going to use our Arduino board as a voltage source. So we're going to put a wire, and remember what I said about how you strip wires, we're going to put a wire into the ground lead labeled GND here and run it up here onto our breadboard. We're going to put a wire into the plus five volt supply here and run it up here onto our black uh, breadboard. Then we're going to pull out a one kilo ohm resistor and put it um, across these two wires. The fritzing circuit lights up in green the parts of the breadboard that are connected together. So here's the one kilo ohm resistor connected across the Arduino, and we're going to repeat the experiment with 100 ohms. So here we go. What I have done first is to set my meter to the volts range, and here is the lead plugged into the volts ohms milliamps with the switch set to volts DC, that's what these straight lines mean. And I've got the red lead on the plus five volt side and the black lead on, on the minus or ground uh, side, and I'm reading 4.909 volts. So you see straight away, actually the five volt output of an Arduino is quite a bit less. Now I've taken the resistor out of the circuit and I put the meter to ohms, and I am measuring its resistance, and I thought this is 1000 ohms, but it's telling me it's 994 ohms. That's easily within the tolerance, um, but uh, anyway, there we go. Now what I'm doing is I've pulled the positive lead off the breadboard here, so I've broken this circuit. I've inserted my meter into the circuit here, but before I did that, I moved the red lead from the volt ohms milliamps connection onto the amps connection, 
and switch the meter to amps DC and I see 0 0.005. Now remember, Ohm's law told me that current was voltage divided by resistor, so 4.909 divided by 994 ohms, and that is 0 0.0049 amps, or 5 milliamps, and that's what the meter is reading. Now we put the 100 ohm resistor in, and so, Notice something straight away where it's not that 4.909 volts anymore. We're 4.804 volts. And I've measured the resistance here, switched over to ohms, and it's 97 ohms, so it's a little bit less than 100 ohms. And then I have pulled the lead out of here, put it into the amps, broken the circuit here, put the meter in series, and I see 50 milliamps. Current is voltage divided by resistance, 4.804 divided by 97.7, which is 0 0.0492 amps, or 50 milliamps, as measured. Okay, now let's make something a little more complicated. So I still use the Arduino as my power supply, but I now put two 1 kilo ohm resistors in series, and I'm going to look at the voltage right here at the junction of these resistors. So here we go. Notice now we're back up to over 4.9 volts, 4.916 volts across the resistors. If I measure the voltage at the midpoint, I get 2.456 volts between ground and the midpoint. And if I measure the current through this, I get 0.002 amps or 2 milliamps through the whole circuit. So what's going on? Here is a schematic of my voltage divider, two one kilo ohm resistors in series, and they're connected between the five volt pin and the ground pin of the Arduino. So there's a total of five volts supplied across these two resistors. Now, let me introduce you to uh, some laws with fancy names, um, although their result is, I think, entirely obvious, and that is Kirchhoff's laws. And Kirchhoff's laws say the sum of any voltages around a loop must be zero. They also say the current out of any node, so that's any point where the wires split up, the sum of those currents is zero, i.e. current in equals current out. So applying Kirchhoff's law to this circuit, the voltage across this resistor V1 plus the voltage across this resistor V2 must be equal to this applied voltage 5 volts. V1 plus V2 is 5 volts. There are no places for the current to go here except into this resistor, out again into this resistor, and then back into ground. And so that says that I1, the current here, must equal I2, must equal I3, and we'll just call it I. This voltage drop, according to Ohm's law, is IR1. This voltage drop here, V2, is IR2. Now, in this case, we've made it very simple. We've had R1 equals R2, and therefore V1 equals V2, and the, there must be then equal to 5 volts divided by 2. The current you can get from either of these equations, um, since the total voltage here is, is 5 volts, or 2.5 volts across each of those resistors, uh, then the current will be 2.5 volts divided by 1 kilo ohm, or two and a half milliamps. We actually measured two because our meter didn't go there in terms of digits. Now, let's just imagine that we look at these two resistors as though one resistor had been placed here. We had five volts supplied across the circuit, and we were drawing a current of two and a half milliamps. This means that this resistor, combined resistor here, looks like uh, of a um, two kilo ohm resistor, five divided by two and a half. That is just the sum of this resistance and this resistance. So we arrive at a rule for resistors placed in series, which is that the total resistance of two resistors in series is just the sum of the individual resistances. And if we put more than that, three resistors and so on, we simply add them up to get the total effective resistance of a series of resistors placed in series. 
Now let's take a look at resistors in parallel, and we'll also introduce another concept, which is the Thevenin equivalent circuit. Okay, so now what I've done is I've taken my 1K here across 5 volts, and I put the other one in parallel across it here. And let's see what happens. So now we have 4.9 volts measured across our circuit, and the current through it now is 10 milliamps. And so the effective resistance then is 5 volts divided by 10 milliamps, or about 500 ohms, specifically 490 ohms when we put this 4.9 volts in. What's happened? Okay, now we use the Kirchhoff laws about nodes. It says the current going in here must equal this current plus this current coming out, or I, I equals I1 plus I2. But what are they? There is a voltage here across these two resistors, and that must be equal to the total applied voltage because there's nothing else in series with them. And so, therefore, the current through this resistor is V divided by R2. I2 is V over R2. This current is V over R1. And the sum of these is equal to the total current, which must be V over the total effective resistance of two resistors in parallel. So V over R1 plus V over R2 is V over the effective total resistance, or since the Vs cancel out, 1 over R is 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2. And if we had more resistors in parallel, we'd add the reciprocals up here. For just two resistors, you can simplify this by making a common denominator R1 times R2. And then you invert to get that the effective resistance is R1 R2 over R1 plus R2. Of course, this is quite trivial when the two resistors are equal. It's one kilo ohm squared divided by two kilo ohms or 500 ohms, which is what we measured. With 500 ohms and five volts, the current is 10 milliamps, and that is what we measured. So here we go. We put these two in parallel, and here we are, 489.9 ohms. Now, let's go back to our voltage divider. So now we move this wire over here, and we put our two one kilo ohm resistors in series, but we're going to load this point here with a one kilo ohm resistor to ground. All right, let's have a look at what happens. The total voltage across here is now 4.9 volts. The voltage across this bottom part of the voltage divider is 1.64 volts. What's happening? Well, let's have a look at this. Remember we said two resistors in parallel have a resistance R1, R2 over R1 plus R2, or for two one kilo ohm resistors, this is uh, 500 ohms. So our circuit now really looks like one kilo ohm in series with half a kilo ohm. So the current will be this applied voltage, or about five volts, divided by one plus 0.5 kilo ohms, V over 1.5 kilo ohms, and 5 volts divided by 1.5 is K, is 3.33 milliamps. Notice I'm jumping here, it's actually thousands of ohms, one over thousandths is millis, and so I have jumped to say that 5 volts over 1.5 K, 3.33 milliamps. Okay, now what will V2 be? There's a current 3.33 milliamps, flowing through 500 ohms, so V equals IR, or 3.33 milliamps times 500 ohms, and that is 1.66 volts as observed. Now let's play some tricks. Let's introduce the concept of a Thevenin equivalent voltage. Let's pretend that we didn't know we had a five volt power supply and a, a pair of resistors in series to make a voltage divider. If we put no load on here at all, and we stick our meter here, we measure 2.5 volts. Aha, I'm not drawing any current from this, and I get 2.5 volts. There must be a 2.5 volt battery in here, 
And this is the Thevenin equivalent voltage. Now, once again, you know it's five volts across a voltage divider. But if I put a black box around here, you wouldn't. So you would measure this quantity at no load that you would call the Thevenin or should call the Thevenin equivalent voltage two and a half volts. Now, if I put a resistor on there as a load, I measure a smaller voltage, 1.66 volts. I therefore conclude that there must be a resistance in series with my voltage source, and I'm going to call that the Thevenin equivalent resistance. So we are replacing the real circuit, a five volt source and a voltage divider of two equal one kilo ohm resistors, with a fake circuit of a Thevenin equivalent voltage and a Thevenin equivalent resistance in series. What is the Thevenin equivalent resistance? Well, when we put a kilo ohm on here, we measured 1.66 volts. So the current coming out of this source is 1.66 volts divided by 1K, or 1.66 milliamps. Okay, so with 1.66 milliamps coming out of here, we drop from the Thevenant equivalent voltage of 2.5 down to 1.6. Therefore, this resistor must have dropped across it 2.5 minus 1.66 volts. Here we go. And if we divide that by the current, we calculate this resistance and we get 500 ohms. So, our Thevenin equivalent circuit is a two and a half volt voltage source in series with a 500 ohm resistor. You know the real circuit was five volts across a voltage divider made up of two 1K resistors. Just an aside here, you can show in general that when you have a voltage divider consisting of resistor one and resistor two in series, the Thevenin equivalent is equal, resistance is equal to the parallel combination of those two resistors. All right, why is this useful? You'll see in the subsequent exercises. But to begin with, we're going to go back to that strange observation that the voltage across our circuit was A not five volts, understood. The, the voltage regulator inside our uh, Arduino is not uh, precision. But when we put different resistors across it, we observed different readings uh, uh, for the output of our voltage regulator. So with no load, we have 4.92 um, volts. When we put a one kilo ohm load on, it drops to 4.909. And when we put 100 ohms on, it drops from 4.804. So an exercise for you to do at home First of all, tell me what the Thevenin equivalent voltage of the Arduino power supply is. And we just measured that, so it's not complicated. And then from these readings here, work out what the Thevenin equivalent resistance of that Arduino supply is. And is it the same resistance in these two cases? I'll let you work that out at home, but we're going to do this again and again and again, because in the next module, we will uh, discuss how to make a, a voltage source with a low equivalent Thevenin resistance.